Well, good morning. Everybody awake? Good. We're starting a new teaching series today. And I, you know, the reason we do a uh, series is because um, sometimes, like, it's important. It's, you can take a, a subject and, and it just takes a long time to say everything that you can or everything that needs to be said about one thing. And I've been hearing hints lately from some of you guys that I preach too long anyways. Imagine if I took five weeks worth of information and put it in one sermon. You would love that, wouldn't you? So, yeah, okay. So that's why we do series. Um, and, and, you know, the other is it gives us time to kind of marinate around a subject, around a topic, you know. And um, so we're actually getting ready to start this, this series of conversations called Five Things I Wish You Knew About My God. And here's the genesis of that. Here's where that came from. Um, I, I actually make an effort to spend time with people who don't think like I do, who don't live like I do, who don't act or believe like I do. And it's really interesting to spend time with, with people like, that aren't like me and just listen. Just listen to what they, what they believe about life. Listen to what they believe about uh, money, about marriage, about work, about God. And um, so I've recently, in the last several months, been intentionally spending time with people who don't believe like I do about God. And uh, many who don't even believe in God or believe that there is a God. Some believe that there is a God, but he's kind of disengaged. And um, so I've spent a lot of time listening to, to my friends who believe this. And um, I've started thinking uh, like this. If I were, if, if my friends were to invite me to lunch um, and say, Paul, I'd like you to just talk to me about your God, what would I say to them? And so as we talk through these next five weeks, my hope is that, first of all, if you're here and you don't believe in God, that you would be my friend on the other side of the table at Red Bull because that's where all good lunches are eaten. Can I get a witness? Right? So you would be on the other side of the table, and we'd be having this conversation. And, and if, you, if you already believe in God, my hope is that as we have these conversations that maybe you will begin to think through, if someone were to ask me, what would I say to them? If they were to ask me about my God, how would I answer them? What would I say to them? This is what I would say to my friend, my friends who don't believe in God. Uh, this is the beginning of a conversation that I would have with them, and I thought it would be helpful to have together as a church. So um, this series is my answer to my friend or my friends. So the very first thing that I would say to my friend about uh, my God is this. I don't always understand God. That's the first thing I would say. If we were to sit down at the table at Red Bull, and they were to say, well, tell me about your God. The first thing that I would say, I don't always understand my God. Now, to some of you, this might actually seem like the wrong place to start. Um, but let me tell you why I would start here. Because it's true. And I, here's what I, I honestly think this. I think when you say what is true, I think you actually gain credibility. So if you were to be presumptuous enough to claim that you know everything that there is to know about God and you can fully and adequately explain him, the first thing I would say to you is that you have a really small God, right? And, and so the truth of the matter is, is the more we get to know about God, the, the more we realize, oh my gosh, there's so much I don't know about him and I, I, I just don't fully understand him. So that's where I would start. Um, I don't understand everything about God and actually that's really good. Because if I did understand about everything about God, I would manipulate God. And that would be really good for me, uh, because everything I would pray for would eventually become a reality. But it might not be so good for you, because suppose I'm a Clemson fan. I mean, I'm not. I'm not tipping my hat here, but I'm just saying, like, if I got everything I prayed for, because I knew I understood everything about God, and I knew how to pull his strings, I would manipulate him. That would be great for me, but it may not be so good for you. So it actually works out in the end that I don't understand, that no one really understands everything about our God. So, for instance, I don't understand why God lets some things happen. There have been events that have happened in my life and in the lives of other people that I know and love. And I, I look on and say, I don't know why God let that happen. I don't have a good answer. And as a pastor, sometimes people will come and they'll say, why did this happen? And man, that's a crazy place to be. Because the truth is, it doesn't seem right I don't know why that happened. And, and there are times where I, I wonder, well, like, why didn't God make other things happen? We're all praying for the same thing, and it seems like it would be a good thing, God, if you would heal this individual. It seems like these would be great parents. If you would allow them to have a child, it seems like that would be a great thing to do. And yet he doesn't, and I don't understand that. 
Now, Larry Crabb is a Christian psychologist, and he's written a number of books. And, and a few years ago, I read, he had a question, he, had a, he wrote a book called Shattered Dreams, which was profoundly helpful for me as I began to develop my understanding of God. And in it, he asked a question, which for me gets to the essence of this whole thing. This is what he said. How do we trust a sometimes disappointing, seemingly fickle God who fails to do for us what good friends, if they could, would do? Is that a fair question? I mean, you're, you're my friend, and if I came to you and said, listen, I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a bad place here, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying to live my life right, right? I, I mean, I, I go to church, I, I pay my tithe, I pray to God, I, I read his Bible, I help the poor, I, I try to do all these things, right? And I'm asking God for help to, to heal this disease, right? Um, w- w- would you pray with me? And it would seem like if we all agreed on that, that God would say, sure, I would do that doesn't always do that. And as a result, the truth is this. I don't always understand God. And I know this, that I'm not alone in this. I know that there are people in this room who believe in God who don't always understand Him either. And I know there are people who don't believe in God who would say, if that's how God functions, I don't understand Him. And it doesn't make sense to me. Well, let me just step back and say it's the first thing I want to say to you is it's absolutely okay to have those those feelings and express those thoughts because um, we 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 get uh, a, there's a precedent that's been set for this. There was a man named Habakkuk, and he lived 2,600 years ago. He was called a prophet, which was kind of like a preacher, and he lived in the land of Judah, which was kind of like which is like in in modern day Israel, and. Um, God used him greatly. God actually spoke through him. He was kind of like a Billy Graham in his day, a, a, prof- a preeminent spiritual leader that God used in a powerful way. And there's a gentleman named Kenneth Boa who's studied Habakkuk and has written about him. And one of the things he said about Habakkuk was this. He said, Habakkuk was a daring thinker, read this last line with me, please, who openly expressed his doubts to God. I think it's actually liberating to know that a man of God has said to God, I have some questions here. Is that right? No, because what I realize is sometimes if you've been raised in the church for a long time, there's almost been a sense of you can't question God. You can't say to God, I don't understand. You can't say to God, I have a problem with what you're doing. This doesn't make any sense. If I were you, I would do things differently. I have some doubts here. Well, Habakkuk, The Billy Graham of his day was a man that God used in incredible ways, and yet he openly expressed some doubts to God. And we're going to look at those in just a minute. Now, I've been reading a book by a man named Tim Keller. Tim Keller is a pastor in New York City. He's a brilliant thinker, a really, really smart man, and he wrote a book called Reason for God. And I'm I'm working my my way through it, and again, Tim Keller is a smart man, so... um, it takes a while for me to read, my, read those kind of books because I'll, I'll read and I'll have to stop and reread and have to stop and reread and then I'll have to wake up and reread because, you know, what happens when you read really smart people, right? Um, but he had a paragraph in his book that I have to share, share with you. This is what he said. He said, A faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do, will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. Then he said this, A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed or he has failed over the years to listen patiently to his or her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. In other words, he says, if you don't listen to your doubts, if you don't wrestle your doubts to your ground, to the ground, there's going to come a moment in your life where crisis is going to happen or something big is going to happen, something unexplainable is going to happen. And if you haven't wrestled through your doubts and if you haven't faced your questions about God, your faith is going to fall apart. Look what he says next. Believers should acknowledge and wrestle with doubts, not only their own, but their friends and neighbors. It's no longer sufficient to hold beliefs just because you inherited them. I appreciate that. Because I see a man looking at people who call ourselves Christians, and we do, we call ourselves Christians, I do, and and, and many of you in this room would say, I am a Christian. And he's essentially looking at us and saying, 
it's okay, and not only okay, it's actually your responsibility to look at your questions and face your doubts and work your way through them until you have developed a faith that's sturdy enough to, to, handle, or to, to handle anything that life brings your way. That's a big deal. He goes on and says, Only if you struggle long and hard with your objections to your faith will you be able to provide grounds for your beliefs to skeptics, including yourself, that are plausible rather than ridiculous or offensive. He's encouraging us to wrestle with our doubts. And let me just say to you, if you're in this room this morning and you do believe in God, but you have questions and you have doubts, it's perfectly okay. What is not perfectly okay is, is to live the rest of your life with those. What I want to encourage you to do is wrestle with those. Seek answers. Seek, seek answers to the questions and the doubts that you have about your God. And I always tell people this. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to ask questions about Christianity because I believe that our faith is strong enough to handle any question, any doubt that you might have. There are solid, good answers to those questions if you will do the work to seek and to find. Right? So, the bottom line, the first thing I would say to uh, my friend is simply this. I don't always understand God. And it's okay to say that out loud. I don't understand. And Habakkuk shows us how to do this. So he lived in Judah, again, which is a part of modern-day Israel. And it was crazy in those days in Judah, about 2,600 years ago. It was like there was this anarchy in the land. Honestly, as I read through the book of Habakkuk, it reminds me of what's going on in Baltimore right now. If you don't know what's going on in Baltimore right now, it is chaos. Here's a picture of what's going on right now. It is chaos. There's, there's so much anger and angst, and, and, and there's, 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 there's uh, just frustration between, between various groups, the, the police and the African-American community, and, and then you've got some people who have legitimate concerns, and you've got some people who are just there to instigate, and there's just craziness going on. And then you've got people flying in from out of town, you know, commentators, and you've got, you've got other people who are trying to, to bring resolution to the situation, and it becomes political, and it's just crazy. There's violence, there's anger, there's destruction, there's just craziness going on. And as I look at this picture and I follow the story of what's happening in Baltimore, it's almost like Habakkuk was sitting right in Baltimore when he started talking to God. So you look at the picture, and I want to read to you the words that Habakkuk said to God about his country, his land. This is what he said. How long, O Lord, must I cry for help? But you don't listen. There's violence. I cry, but you don't come and save. Must I forever see this sin and misery all around me? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. It's almost like he's watching CNN, isn't it? He said, I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. That would be MSNBC or Fox News, or I don't know, what you, wherever. I'm going to get in deep water here, aren't I? The law, listen to this. He said, the law has become paralyzed and useless. There's no justice given in the courts. I mean, doesn't this sound like modern day craziness? The wicked far outnumber the righteous, and justice is perverted with bribes and trickery. Sounds like that man was watching some news that could have happened today or yesterday or Friday. How long do I have to? I'm praying, I'm asking, and yet I look out my window and I see violence. I look on the TV and I just see perverted justice. I look down the street and it's just chaos. And I'm asking you to show up and do something, and it seems like you don't answer. How long do I have to wait? could very easily be the prayer of a Christian in Baltimore or in any other part of our world for, for that matter. Habakkuk says these words to God, and then God responded to him. He said, I'm going to do something about this craziness. Here's what I'm going to do, Habakkuk. I'm raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. What? They'll, they'll march across the world and conquer other lands. They're notorious for their cruelty and will do whatever they like. Here's my answer, Habakkuk. You've got craziness and chaos and violence and perverted justice. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring some really bad people to your land, right? And, and, and then he said, on they come, hell-bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. Habakkuk heard this. He's incredulous. Like, are you kidding me? Like, God... There's already chaos here, and I'm praying for peace, and your answer is to bring even more violent people. Honestly, it would be like this. It would be like me or you today sitting down and saying, Dear God, you see all the craziness in Baltimore. Would you please do something about this? Would, would you please calm the unrest? Would you please bring peace? Would you please help justice to be served? Would you please do these things? And God says, Yes, I'm going to do something about it. I'm bringing in these guys. 
ISIS. Are you... Toss a little bit in your head. Are you kidding me? That's your answer? You're going to bring ISIS to Baltimore? That makes no sense at all. I mean, let me read these words to you, and I'm going to replace the Babylonians with ISIS. God says, I'm raising up ISIS, a cruel and violent people. They'll march across the world and conquer other lands. They're notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. By the way, did you know that just this weekend they killed 300 more Christians? On they'll come, hell-bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. What would you say to God? Like, that doesn't make any... I don't... Here's, here's what Habakkuk said. Lord, my God! My Holy One, you who are eternal, I mean, you're God, I understand that, but is, is your plan in all this to wipe us out? I mean, surely not. Like, this doesn't make sense. We've got chaos and craziness here, and you're going to bring in really, really, really bad guys to fix the problem? That doesn't make any sense to me. So let's stop from it. Undoubtedly, there have been times in your life where there has been chaos. Your life, maybe perhaps your emotions, your finances, your marriage may have looked like the streets of Baltimore. It was crazy. There was, there was chaos. There was destruction. There was, there was unrest. And you asked God for help, and it seemed like things got worse. Can I get a witness? That ever happened? Yeah. Right. It doesn't make sense. And this is exactly what Habakkuk was going through. He's like, God, there's already problems here, and you're going to make them worse? That's your answer? He said, is, this doesn't make sense, surely not. And th then he went on, and he, he said, um, and he just continued to argue with God in Habakkuk chapter 2. He said, this doesn't make any sense. And his final word to uh, God in Habakkuk chapter 1, I apologize, verse Verse 17 was, will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? Like, is this really your plan? I don't get it. I don't understand how you can use bad guys, bad circumstances to get your will done. And then he said this, and this is hugely instructive. I will climb up into my watchtower now and wait to see what the Lord will say to me and how he will answer my complaint. Habakkuk did something that's profoundly instructive for me, for you, and for all of us who don't understand. He expressed his doubts, and then he waited. He made a complaint against God, and then he waited. See, what I've observed over my experience in ministry, and even unfortunately sometimes in my own life, is that we express our doubts and then walk away. We say, this doesn't make sense, I don't understand, I asked for things to get better. They got worse. Makes no sense. Out. Habakkuk said, I asked for things to get better. They got worse. Makes no sense. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to wait. I've complained. I've said my peace. I've expressed my doubts. Now what? See, if I could just say something to all of us, it would be, don't walk away. Don't dismiss God just because you don't understand. I mean, if you consistently employed that strategy, think about all of the good things in life that you would be missing. For instance, microwaves. Right? Who in here fully understands how a microwave works? I mean, there may be one or two. But for the most part, none of us fully understand how a microwave works. We don't understand it all, but we use it every single day multiple times. Right? Cars? Who of us fully understands how a car works? I mean, I had to explain the other day to a mechanic what my car sounded like. That's embarrassing. <laughs> He's like, do it again. I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean. I don't fully understand how my car works, but I use it all the time. I don't walk away from it just because I don't fully understand it. Computers, cell phones, women. <laughs> that was guaranteed to get 50% applause, right? Your body, do you fully understand how your body works and yet you don't walk away, you don't abandon it? Roads, who fully understands how roads work? Who's been on Ebonport Road lately? <laughs> They're doing a good job. We got to give them a shout out. But just because you don't fully understand something doesn't mean it doesn't work. Isn't that right? There are lots of things in our lives that we don't fully understand and yet we stay engaged. 
And I think one of the things Habakkuk is going to teach us is this. It's, it's, fully under, it's fully appropriate and okay to express your doubt and to, and to air your complaints and to put your frustrations on the table. But for crying out loud, don't disengage. Stay engaged. You might learn something. You might actually be transformed. Imagine if we walked away from the microwave and from the car and from cell phones. And from, imagine if you walked away from everything in your life that you don't understand how small your life would be. But because you continue to stay engaged with things that you don't fully understand, look how full your life is. Imagine if we took that same approach to God. I don't understand what you're doing. It doesn't make a bit of sense that you would do this. Why would you make things worse when I'm praying for them better? I don't understand. I've said my piece. I'm going to wait. That's what Habakkuk did. And then God responded to him. God said, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write my answer in large, clear letters on a tablet so that a runner can read it and tell everyone else. So Habakkuk wrote all this down, and ultimately that's how we ended up having it in our scriptures. I want you to tell everyone else. So part of what God is saying to Habakkuk is also meant for us. Look at this next part. God said, these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely. God, I hate when he says that. Right? Like, let's do it now. Don't, like, slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled, when my plan will be fully fulfilled. If it seems slow, it does. <laughs> Wait. Say it. For it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. God said, I have a plan. It's in place. It may take a while, but here's what I want you to do. Be patient. It's going to happen. And then he said this. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked. That's God's word for jacked up. Their lives are all messed up. They trust in themselves like, hey, I know what to do. Forget, I'm not waiting on God. I'm going to figure it out on my own. God says, yeah, it doesn't work like that. He said, here's what I want you to know. The righteous, or the people who get it right, how are they going to live? By their faith. This is how they make it. They continue to trust in the one who has a plan. He went on, God went on to give Habakkuk a sense of what the future was going to look like. It was admittedly kind of vague, but he basically said to him, I have a plan, I'm working a plan, and, and, it's, and, and, and I want you to know that, Habakkuk. But it really all comes down, here's what I want you to do. The people who get it right will live by faith. By the way, just a, a side note, this verse, Habakkuk 2, uh, 4, is actually used at least three times in the New Testament, and each time it's spoken in the context of faith in Jesus. And basically, as I look at that, it seems to me that God sent His Son Jesus as a personal investment into this world to make sure that things turn out right. And for those who are going through difficult times, there is coming a day when it will all make sense. And scripture, scripture writers after uh, Habakkuk basically grabbed onto this verse and said, listen, for those who are going through crazy days, trust in God. It will turn out all right because Jesus put his life on the line to make sure of that. We, the ones who get it right, will live their lives by faith. Now, step back a minute. Ready? If I were sitting with my friends, I would say, look, I, there are plenty of things in my own life Plenty of times in my own life where I felt like God wasn't there when I needed Him. Or He acted in ways that I didn't understand. And then I might tell them this story. Uh, yesterday, we were at uh, Karis' soccer game. If you don't know, we have six daughters, and five of them play soccer, which means we do a lot of soccer. And so yesterday, we went to Cherry Park, and they have those big fields. And um, so just for perspective, uh, when it seems like... Um, when they take the little kids, they call them kickers. They're like five and six-year-olds, and they, they play soccer. It's really cute to watch. But they, uh, they'll, they'll put them on, on, they'll split them into groups, and then they have them play games. And, and we, were, we started off on this side of the field right over here because we thought that's where their game was going to be played. And uh, we got all set up, got our chairs unfolded and all the stuff ready to go. We were ready to watch the game. And then they came out and said, well, actually, your game is going to be on the other side of the field. So we had to walk all the way around. So now we're sitting over here. Right? Does this make sense, this angle? Right. So when we, st when we started to leave here, um, Ashton, my seven-year-old, and Riley, my four-year-old, uh, they wanted to walk through the woods all the way around 
over to here. And I actually encouraged him. I said, Ashton, why don't you take Riley and walk through the woods? And so they did. They set out on their own. They're a little, a little excited, but a little scared too. And um, I moved on. And there were lots of moments when I, when I knew that there was a little fear, there was a little concern, there was a lot of unknown, and I wasn't there. Or so they thought. Because what they didn't know is I had snuck back around just to keep a daddy eye on my kids. And after about 15 minutes, when I saw they were going to make it, I I ran back to where I had been originally sitting, and, and they popped out of the woods, and this is what we saw. They made it. Now Ashton told me she said I'd been a little scared, but but she had had courage and she made it. And 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 I, as I as I watched this unfold, it began to occur to me that there are times in my life and maybe in yours when it feels like I'm in the woods all alone. That's a great name for a movie. <laughs> and it feels like we really need a strong presence in our life, and yet it seems like he's not there. Now see, I know this as a dad. I had something looked wrong or something wrong started to happen that wasn't in my plan, I'd have been there in a flash. But I also know that my kids get stronger, and they get better when they're put in places that aren't comfortable. And the look on their faces when they came out of the woods said everything I needed to know. I would say to my friends that sometimes my God does this. He puts me in places where I feel lost. He puts me in places where I'm scared. He puts me in places that I don't understand, and then he leaves, or so it seems. Because one of the things he says about himself in Scripture is, I won't ever leave you. I won't ever go away. What I've come to realize about my God is that he does have a plan, and he is doing something that when I fully understand it, I will agree, that's good. So God tipped his hand and he let Habakkuk see. Habakkuk, here's what the future is going to look like. Here's my plan. Habakkuk kind of got it a little bit, and so this is what he said. Habakkuk responded, I've heard all about you, Lord. I went to church. I grew up in church. I know a lot of stuff about you, and I'm filled with awe by the amazing things you've done. I know stories about you, God. Wow. And then he said this, In this time of our deep need, begin again to help us as you did in years gone by. Show us your power to save us, and in your anger, remember your mercy. In other words, God, I, I know some things about you. I, I, I know I've had some experiences with you. I remember those times you've delivered me. The truth is, right now, I'm in a place of deep need. I'm in the woods. I'm in a dark place. I don't understand necessarily what you're doing. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remember the things that you have done. I'm going to ask that you show up again. This is what I love about Habakkuk. He didn't understand and he said it out loud to God. And it's interesting, even when God tipped his hand a little bit and let Habakkuk kind of have a sense of of what the future was going to look like, Habakkuk still fully didn't understand what God was doing. So he started thinking about the times that God had done, acted kindly, acted faithfully, and he wrote some of them down. You can read them in Habakkuk chapter 3. And after doubting out loud, this is what Habakkuk did, he doubted out loud, He waited for God. He thought about God and wrote some of those thoughts down. And he finally said this. I trembled inside when I heard all of this. In other words, even God, when I knew God's going to be with you, he's going to be with you, I still trembled inside. Let me just stop for a second. Don't read anymore. All right? Some of you hear this stuff. You come to church and you hear songs that say, or you hear me say, or you hear someone else say, God is faithful. He will be there And you say, okay, nice sentence, nice thought, nice idea, but I'm still scared to death. Well, there was another guy who felt the same way. His name was Habakkuk. Have I talked about him at all ever? He was kind of like the Billy Graham of the past, right? He said, God, I know you're going to be there. I I know it's going to work out, but I'm still trembling inside when I hear all this stuff that's going to happen. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me. I shook in terror. I'm scared, God, he said. 
In other words, even though I know it's going to turn out for good, even though I know that you're going to be there, I still don't fully understand why you're doing this. So this is what I'm going to do, he said. I'll wait quietly for the coming day when the disaster will strike the people who invade us. In other words, I'm just going to, I'm going to endure. Through all the craziness that's coming, I'm just going to endure because I know you're working a plan. And then look at this. He said, and as we read these words, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember that Habakkuk lived in an agricultural uh, society. Their economy was driven by the, by the well-being of the land. If the land was good, if the crops were good, if the animals were healthy, they made money. If they weren't, they suffered. So Habakkuk said, in this coming chaos, in all the craziness that's about to come, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vine, so there goes you know, my, my fruit stand, and even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, so even though I'll not be able to produce olive oil and sell it to Harris Teeter, and even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, so even though I won't be able to raise my sheep to produce material for clothes, and even though I won't be able to butcher my cattle and sell them, my economy is going to tank. Times are going to get really tough. But even though all that is going to happen, here's what I'm going to do. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. In other words, even though times are tough, I'm going to say good things about you, God. Even though I don't understand, I'm going to say good things to you, God. And then he came to this conclusion. The sovereign Lord is my strength. Now, if you don't know what sovereign means, that means totally in control. In fact, in some countries, they'll call their king the sovereign. He's in complete control. And Habakkuk said, the sovereign Lord is my strength. The God who is totally in control is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer and brings me safely over the mountains. If you don't know, I mean, you could, you could actually do this now if you won't get distracted. Um, pull out your phones and, and look up a Google this image. It, it, like deer in Israel, right? And it'll show you pictures of deer on the mountains in Israel. It's crazy, crazy mountains up there. It's crazy terrain, it's unsure, but David said, or uh, Habakkuk said, even through the craziness of what we're getting ready to go through, you'll make me as sure-footed as a deer, and you'll bring me safely over the mountains. I'm going to make it, because you're in control. So if we were having this conversation with my friends, well, you know what I would say. The first thing I would say is, there are plenty of times that I don't fully understand my God. But based on what I've learned from my experience, and based on what Habakkuk has told me, here's what I choose to do. I choose to trust Him, even when I don't understand Him. And I do this for a lot of things. I don't stop driving just because I don't fully understand my car. I don't stop texting even though I don't fully understand my phone. I don't stop loving even though I don't fully understand my wife. And I find that when I trust God, even when I don't understand Him, I eventually come out of the woods stronger and more confident. And I realize His plan was good. And some of you are probably in the woods now. And you're in a crazy place. And you've asked God to help. And if he has answered, it's kind of sounded like this. Well, I'm going to help you, but things might get a little crazy. He, God might be doing some things that, that you don't understand. Or you may not even appreciate the things that God is doing in your life right now. I would just encourage you to say those things out loud to God. Say those things. And then wait. Listen, watch. God may speak and you may get it. You may have an, ah, oh, that's why moment. And you may not. Habakkuk, we saw, he heard that God had a plan, but it didn't eliminate his fear, but he kept trusting. And I would just encourage you today to do the same thing. Say some things to God. But then eventually it'll end up where Habakkuk ended up. And that is this. I will trust you even when I don't understand you. I will trust you even when I don't understand you. Now the band is going to come up and they're going to lead us in some songs that we're going to sing to God. A, a, songs, a song that's filled with words of trust. The song we ended it with. I am not alone. As we sing these words, I really want to encourage you just... To, to speak these words and make them your own. Make them your prayer to God. And after we're done today, if, if you feel like you have more that you want to say to God or 
words that you need to say to God or a prayer that you want to pray or you want someone to pray with you. As you walk out today, there's a room out here on your left-hand side. There's a desk in there. It's called the information desk. We're actually going to have a handful of people back in that room today that will listen to you, that will pray with you if you're interested. And by the way, these people are available to pray with you about anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that we're talking about today. Maybe you have a friend or a relative that's going through something crazy. You want a prayer. They'll be available to you in that back room. I encourage you to, to go there and pray with these people. I know them. I trust them. I love them. And um, they can be trusted. And we're going to pray and then we're going to speak these words to God. Now, Father, there are times in our lives where we find ourselves in places that we don't understand. It doesn't make sense how you operate. There are days, Lord, when we pray prayers that it would seem like the right thing to do would be to answer those prayers, and yet there's nothing. And it would seem, Lord, that, that there are times where you'd show up where you don't. I, we don't understand why you do what you do, but here's what we've learned, and Habakkuk as well learned the same thing. It's you or God who's in control. And sometimes you're working plans that we have no idea above. We have no idea what you're doing. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be humble in this world and to trust you. To say things to you, Lord, that might include a complaint, that might include the expression of a doubt. To ask questions, Lord. And then to trust. Because, Father, over, over history, you've proven yourself to be good and faithful. You've proven yourself to be trustworthy. Lord, as we sing these words to you, I pray they'll be more than just words on a screen. But I pray they'll, that they will actually be words from our heart to you. They'll be expressions of faith. They'll be expressions of confidence from people, Lord, who, can, who, who often hit those dark places. May we express with these words, Lord, the truth in our heart. And as we do, Father, I pray that, that you would reach out and put your arm of love, as it were, on our shoulders. Remind us that you love us deeply. At the end of the day, because our God is sovereign, we will get to the place that you're taking us. In Christ's name.